Um, so, I'll switch this sound work. Brilliant. I'm just going to take you really briefly through a quick introduction of Helen Douglas House, um, where it all started. Some of you will have known this story, some of you might be completely new to us, the charity, um, but we're delighted that you're all here tonight, um, hoping to conquer a mountain on our behalf. Um, so, Helen Douglas House. Um, was the first children's hospice in the whole world. So it was a completely new concept, a new idea. Um, and it was from Sister Frances. So Sister Frances was helping a local family. Their daughter was called Helen. Um, she realised that there was no proper support for families and young children um, in end-of-life care. Um, so she thought, well, you know, something should be done about this. So she set up in 1982 Helen House, which is just across the way. So we are two hospices, we are one, one hospice together, but Helen House is across the way and you're sat in Douglas House right now. Um, Helen House is set up for families and that was the really important thing. It wasn't just about the patient and just leaving kind of your child here to be cared for, it was about the whole family receiving support and care. From the very um, beginning when they first had to understand and come to the realisation of their child having a terminal illness through to living with the child and enabling the child to have as fulfilled life as possible, through to right at the end and then beyond that. And when their child has passed away, we're still here to help support that family. The important thing about what we do is that we think of each family and each patient as being unique. Everyone has different circumstances and different symptoms that we need to be able to cater for, to support families with. So it really is about individual care, individual love, and supporting the whole family. Um, in 2004, it was realised that actually quite a few, not huge numbers, but quite a few of the patients that were in Helen House were actually achieving older ages than was at first expected. Medical advances had come through. So in 2004, Douglas House was built, where it was at. So Douglas House is for children aged around 16 up to around 35. Um, not a huge numbers get over the age of 30 at the moment, but hopefully with medical advances, we will see people living longer. Um, Douglas House is slightly different in the way that um, patient care is provided, in the fact it's about enabling independence. So a 16-year-old doesn't necessarily want their parents around the whole time. No, they want to go to, well, not to the pub, I was going to say the pub, 18. <laughs> 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 But Jane has been known to be an 18 year old and above um, to the pub or out shopping um, to football matches um, without their parents' support. Um, it's really important to us that children come here and are able to live kind of as they want to. So if they want to stay up until 4 a.m. playing computer games, well, you know, they can. We've got the care provision here to allow that. Um, whereas those perhaps living at home may have to have more, um, their lives more decided for them. So they have breakfast at 8am, lunch at 12, dinner at 8, back into bed at 9. We can have that flexibility to allow them to have that independent young person sort of lifestyle. Um, but again, it's about thinking about families. So we do have flats available in both houses, so whole families can come and stay while their child's been um, cared for here. Um, that happens a lot in Helen House. Not so much again here, but there is still that provision for people to come and stay, for parents to come and stay. Well. Um, and whether that um, is kind of families of one, two, five, we actually have provision to allow multiple siblings to come at once and really enjoy the space of Helen and Douglas House. What was really important was that we actually decided to become consultant doctor led. So we wanted to provide the best medical care possible, which enables families to really trust in what we do. Um, it also enables us to work with local, local hospitals as well. Um, they believe in us and they will refer patients to us, which is really important. We want to be known as the best care providers and we want hospitals and people to be happy to send patients our way. Um, what you may not know is that we not only support patients in-house, but we actually have an outreach team. And this outreach team goes beyond the four walls. As this map shows, they cover quite a wide area. Um, we've actually got a map in fundraising that shows where all the families that Helen Douglas House support are from. And that goes down from kind of um, the south coast to South Wales to Coventry. 
we actually have a much bigger area than just Oxfordshire. And these are the four tertiary hospitals that we have links with. Um, so they will be directing patients to us. Um, it is important to note that we not only look after patients with long-term terminal illnesses um, that may be diagnosed at a relatively, well, will be diagnosed at a relatively young age, and um, we also deal with and help families who may have had um, children involved in things like car accidents, and we will support the family to come to terms with that and to deal with losing that child. Perhaps also meningitis as well, um, so it isn't just those genetic degenerative diseases that we help with. So that was a very, very quick run through of Helen Douglas House. I just wanted to give you a brief understanding of who we are and why you'd be conquering this mountain. Um, but to support the families that we do support, we have to raise huge sums of money. And that is why we do things like this. We do also Santa's on the run, we have a side star, <laughs> rainbow run, lots of different events. Um, Christmas concerts, the new one. But to be able to do that, and to support those um, parents and children, we have to raise £5.2 million pounds per year. And we're not part, um, we're not funded by the NHS, just 12%. Um, so we have to do a huge amount of fundraising. So that's why we set up things like Conquer Kilimanjaro. So I just wanted to show you very quickly um, a film of a family that we support. Um, it's the Illingworth I'm going to show you this evening. It's just a really short piece of video. Um, just bear with me while I set it up, because again, the projection's not really liking it. <laughs> just bear with me. Um, just. The boy was always slightly behind other children of uh, similar age, but we always made excuses for them. Being new parents, we didn't know any better either, but being a child, and with hindsight, you could see there was something wrong. Sadly, we lost Ben nearly two years ago in October 2012. Uh, about a month short of his, what would have been his 10th birthday. And I remember coming in to set him down before I go to bed myself. And that was probably about 10 o'clock ish. And I set him down, said good night to him, and I loved him as I always did. And that was the last time I saw him alive. Yeah, as I say, in three. Um, Mari had also turned up shortly after that, and they stayed with us. And supported us after we were told there was nothing they could do for them. In our darkest hour it still showed the level of care and attention they gave to his families and we would lie on them then. Whilst Helen House supports children and teenagers, Douglas House... That's just one of the many families that we support here in Helen Douglas House. Um, <laughs> I'm glad Hannah's joined the team. It <laughs> would be, be great. Um, so what I didn't mention before is the kind of depth of our support for families. Um, not only do we support them um, during their time here, but I say through outreach work as well. And um, we also have counselling services. So we have a whole bereavement team who will help counsel and support those families afterwards. We also have things like sibling club which is um, just for those siblings of pa patients. Um, they can come together and just have a really good time getting to know other children that are going through similar circumstances that they are. Um, and also Dad's Club is available as well. So again, the dads um, experiencing things that they want to share with others, but also go to the pub and just socialise. Um, so there's a lot of additional bits and pieces that we do, as well as the medical care um, that's provided here on site. Thank you very much, Hannah. And we will be here to support you throughout your trip. So I'll pass over to Hannah, who will talk to you more about the technical aspects of the trip. I'm just going to have um, a quick chat through um, of what you can expect, what you need to take, your itinerary and stuff like that, and there'll be time for questions at the end. Okay, so the projector is the best, which is quite nice. Um, but as you can see, um, this is an absolutely stunning view, and this is from night three of your climb up Kilimanjaro. And this isn't something we've got off um, Google, this isn't just stock. This is a photo that my colleague Jan took on the third night of his climb. Um, so you can see down below here, Moshi, that's what you'll be saying. Um, and you can see up above, 
um, the stars. And at this point, no one in Africa will be higher than you are unless they're in a plane. Um, but obviously, because it's lovely and dark, no light pollution, you can see this amazing kind of, you can see the stars, um, it looks absolutely amazing. Um, it's really like not comparable to anywhere else. <laughs> so, I'm sure some of you know about Mount Kilimanjaro. It's the highest freestanding mountain in the world and it's the highest mountain in Africa. Um, it does look quite daunting from here. And while I did first get my first glimpse of it, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm never going to make it to the top. But you will make it to the top and that's why you need to sign up today. And we're here to make sure that you make us the top. Good. I was going to say, please don't freeze on me. Um, so, this is what you get um, with us and Helen Douglas House. Um, so, we want you guys to feel safe, we want you guys to take your time, and we want to give you the best shot at making the summit. So, with us, you get a fully supported trek. Um, so, we tra all your transfers, your accommodation, your meals, your guiding services, so these are expert guides, they're up and down the mountain day in, day out, your porters, your cooks, your park permits, everything that you normally have to sort of arrange separately, we sort that all out for you, just to take the stress out. Um, and if you want to fly with us as well, we'll sort your flights out. So it's a full and complete package. Okay. Um, so on day one, you'll arrive at Heathrow Airport, you'll have your lovely Helen Douglas House t-shirts on. Um, these are really, really good because they mean you won't get lost. And they also mean that because you're with a charity, everyone will be super nice to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> what I would recommend is that you wear your trekking clothes, um, or at least some of them with you um, on the journey. We have had one incident, this is very, very rare, where someone's bag um, did not turn up. Um, so if you've got your boots, your trousers, and all that on you, then you can start your trek. Um, and then the porter will run up the mountain with your bag um, when it arrives, and you'll have it in no time at all. Okay. So when you arrive at the other side, um, our expert team will pick you up in the bus at the airport and hopefully, weather permitting, if it's nice and clear, you will get your first glimpse of the mountain. You can see there's a bit of cloud cover here, um, but you might be lucky and get a nice clear day. Um, I did actually think uh, that the snowy park was another cloud, so that's how big it is and how high it is. Um, and then someone was like, no, that's not the mountain, and I was like, oh, okay. And you really do get a sense of what you're about to do, um, but as I said, we'll do everything we can to make sure you guys make it. Where did you guys fly into? Uh, no, we fly into Kilimanjaro oh, really? um, because it's quite. We used to fly into Dar, but it's quite a long drive. Yeah. Um, I think it's about 12 hours by bus, and people do not enjoy that. So <laughs> we fly you straight into Kili, um, nice and convenient. Um, so you'll have a bit of time to settle in. You'll have a briefing day in Moshi. Moshi is this lovely little sleepy coffee town. Um, so you can have a wander around, get used to Tanzania, um, take in sights, um, have a little coffee on a rooftop bar if you like. Um, and this is where you get your first amazing views of Kili as well. Um, on this day, you'll get a full briefing from the guides. Um, you'll get the opportunity to hire any kit that you want to hire, because we do offer some. Um, and you can sort of ask any questions, any concerns you've got, um, and you'll have a good chance to settle in, get a good night's sleep um, before the climb begins. Okay, so day one, you'll head off to Makana Gate. Um, this is where you'll wear your bags and you'll wear your bags out. Um, they are very, very strict with conservation of the park, no litter, so you've got to bring out everything that goes in. Um, you usually have about 23 kilos of baggage um, allowed. Don't worry, you won't be carrying that all yourself. So it's not a situation where you have a huge bag and you'll be hiking with a great big bag on your back. Um, our porters will carry most of your stuff. All you need to carry is your day pack. That's a normal size rucksack and that's got your coat, your water, your snacks. Um, just the things that you'll need during the day. So everything else, your tents, um, all your other stuff is in your big bag and that'll be carried up by the porters. And these guys are amazing, like they can run up with like five rucksacks in a bag, you know, singing, dancing, like they do it every day. So um, they're absolutely amazing. So no need to worry about, um, you know, the extra kind of effort of trekking with all your gear. You can if you want, but I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, um, so this is quite a long walk. Um, it's quite a big walking day, but because you're solo down, um, it's quite a nice pleasant walk because um, it's not high altitude at all. Um, so you'll be going from Makale Gate to Makale Hut, which is your campsite. Um, this is a kind of jungly trek, um, so it'll be six or seven hours. You'll have colourful birds, you'll have monkeys swinging through the trees, 
um, it's an absolutely amazing day. We think about killiers as well. Um, you'll go from something like this, so t-shirt weather, jungle, um, right up to um, the glaciers at the top within a matter of a few days. Um, so it's really amazing as well just to see the scenery change. Um, and this is where you'll be camping on the first night. Um, so this is about 3,000... 3,026 metres above sea level. Um, you guys will camp two to a tent and the tents will be provided and set up um, by your guides and your porters. Um, so as I said, you're fully supported. All you've got to concentrate on is getting to the top. So, day two. Um, the porters will come round. As much as you can knock on a tent, they will knock on your tent door. Unzip the tent, probably a bit sleepy, um, probably a bit tired. They'll be like tea, coffee or hot chocolate. And they'll bring you a nice hot drink and they'll bring you a little bowl of water so you can clean up, wash your face. We do not have showers on the mountain, we don't have toilets, so you're very, very much back to nature for these six days, but you're all in the same boat, and after day three, no one will care. Um, <laughs> but you will get a few little luxuries, um, and if you do want anything, you do need anything, just ask the guys, ask the porters, they'll bring you. Um, so this day, you'll be climbing a little bit higher, as you can see, it's changing. Um, and you're now up into Alpine um, Scrub, I think it's called. Um, you'll be going up to um, Shira Plateau. And um, what the guys will be doing throughout your trek um, is snapping a few photos of you guys. Um, so at every stage, you'll have a few pictures taken. They'll WhatsApp it back to us, they'll text it back to us, and we'll pop them up um, on our rare tracker for your friends and family. <coughs> so if anyone's following you back home, you've got a mum that's a bit anxious, you've got friends that are following you once you make the summit, um, then we do update those as often as we can, um, just so everyone can see. Does everyone here use Twitter? We've had quite a lot of people sign up just to kind of follow people, so I expect we'll have a lot of um, followers. Yeah, why well, follow those? Yeah, I was going to say, I guess you know that. Was that? No, no public toilet. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's intermittent, so we receive the photos when, you know, when they've got signal. But you can actually get signal on the summit. It's very strange. People have been able to try and text, try and phone. It's really weird. But yeah, as I said, no toilets, but some Wi-Fi. So we've obviously got all four priorities in order. Um, <laughs> So this is the shortest day as well, it's about four hours walking. So you had quite a lot of walk yesterday. This is a bit higher, but a bit shorter for you. So we like to eat you in. This is a longer route. Um, so there are quicker ways you, that you can get up, um, but we don't want to push you too hard and we want to make sure that you've got the best chance of making the summit. We don't want to push you too hard. Um, and also it has the benefit of being a little bit quieter as well. So there won't be crowds, um, there won't be loads and loads of groups like, you know, grappling for space and campsites and all that sort of thing. So um, this is a nice kind of route, especially if you haven't done something like this before. You'll be above the clouds this day um, at about 3,700 uh, metres as well. Okay, so day three. This is where you guys will start to feel the burn a little bit. Um, so you'll start to feel the altitude, um, but that's fine because this is our acclimatisation day. Um, and the thing about climbing mountains is you've got to climb high and sleep low, um, and that gives you a chance uh, for your body to sort of adapt um, and give you a better chance of making summit. Um, so you'll be woken up by, by the guides early in the morning. Um, you'll be doing some yoga and breathing exercises. I don't know if we've got any yoga fans here, um, but if you're not yoga fans, you will be by the end of this um, because it does make you, um, it does make you feel better and it does help you a lot. Um, so you might feel actually today a little bit headachey, but a good night's sleep will sort out for you. And if you ever need anything or you're not feeling well, just let the guys know. They know what they're doing, like they go up and down every single day and um, yeah, just tell them basically. Um, you can see in the corner here, very small person. <laughs> uh, this little one is 10 years old and he made the summit. So he was flagging quite a lot on the last day, falling asleep as he was walking, bless him. Really tired, but he did make it. And on this same trip as well, we did have a 74 year old. So it doesn't matter what age you are, how fit you are, you can do this. It's very, very accessible. People think, oh my goodness, I can't climb a mountain, but you absolutely can. Um, if it's all guy can, you can. Um, so as I said, climb high and sleep low. Um, you will be going to Shira Hut, from Shira Hut to Barranco Camp um, via Lava Tower. So you'll go from about 3,700 metres up to about 4,600 and back down to camp at 3,900 metres. And that gives you um, a chance to adjust the lower oxygen. And as I said before, um, this was the night, third night, um, where you can see these, start seeing these amazing views. 
So you can see all those words down there, that's moshi, um, where you'll be staying at the beginning and end. And you'll look down and you'll think, I can't believe I was there two days ago. Um, because you really do, you really are up high now and you're starting to feel the altitude and you're starting to get towards the summit. It's starting to look a little bit more like the surface of the moon. And yeah, just feel free to snap as many photos as you like. We've got absolutely thousands, but we always love more, um, especially from, um, you know, guys are doing the challenges with us. Um, so on day four, um, this looks a lot, lot scarier than it is. I feel like um, my colleague took this for dramatic effect. Her anchor wall looks like a sheer cliff face. It's not at all. It's a little bit more strenuous than just walking, which is what you've been doing um, previously. Um, it's a couple of hours of scrambling, but you won't need anything like you don't need packs, you don't need poles, you don't need anything like that. Um, and then this is, this is where you're really building up to the summit. So um, at the end of this day, you'll have a bit of sleep and you'll um, start at midnight um, your attempt at the summit. So just a couple more pictures. Yeah, so you'll you're, you're arrive at Barafu Camp, which is about 4,600 metres above sea level. Um, so you're really high up now, there's pretty much nothing here. Um, amazing views, absolutely spectacular. Now you'll have Five hours sleep, I'm really sorry. Um, but you'll, have, you, you'll get only five hours sleep and then it's time um, for the summit to climb. So you'll be woken up by the guides, everyone reacts differently to this. Some people are raring to go, are really excited, some people are tired and don't want to get out of bed. I'm definitely in the second camp. But once you get going, it's all good. Um, if you've got any sort of motivation playlist or anything like that, tonight is the night that you'll need the playlist. <laughs> Save your battery and your iPod for tonight because you will need it. Uh, this photo is taken a bit later on, uh, when the sun's come up. Um, you will be starting in dark, so all you'll probably be able to see is the person sort of walking in front of you, but that's good, um, because it means you won't always be looking up, you won't always be looking ahead and thinking, oh, I've got so far to go. Um, so it's quite a slow walk, because obviously you're, you're all feeling the altitude now, it's quite high up. Um, it's, quite, it's quite a slow kind of one foot in front of the other. I'm not going to lie, it's hard, um, but when you get to the top, it is worth it. Also, you'll stop frequently for breaks, sweets, uh, cups of tea, coffee, chat with the guys, just to make sure that everyone's okay. And it's about six hours total to Stella Point, so it's quite a long slog, um, but it will be worth it, trust me. Okay, so Stella Point um, is the crater rim, so it's the penultimate point in your climb before you get to the peak. Um, so this is very, very high, it's 5,600 metres above sea level. Um, and if you've managed to make it before sunrise, and this is great motivation to make it before sunrise, um, you'll see the sunrise. Um, so everyone can just have a little sit down, have a little moment, watch the sunrise, have a rest, and everyone sort of reacts in their own way. Some people are taking selfies, some people are just sitting there quietly. Um, it's really up to you guys, and everyone really does respond differently. But it's a nice little break in, in the walk, and it really does show you that you're nearly there. <coughs> So after a little sit down, we are on to the summit. So it's about another 200 meters. Um, what I would suggest you don't do is get overconfident and run, because my colleague decided that he was going to do a little run um, because he wasn't feeling, he was feeling great, you know, as far as he was concerned. He ran for about five seconds and ended up spending five minutes getting his breath back. So take it slowly. Um,